Hello, my name is Mordred Viking and I'd like to welcome you to this brand new series. Basically, this is going to be a collection of videos which talk about various aspects of various grand strategy games. So this one is going to be the one which kicks off the tutorials over Europa Universalis 4. It is basically a video which is introducing you to the game. It will go through the first year or two of gameplay, plus all of the uh, setup required and how to decide on which country to play as, that type of thing. This is something I've wanted to do for a while now, but haven't really had the time or the resources to do it. But thank you very much to the excellent generosity of my Patreon supporters, I am now able to do this. So as promised, I was going to do one of these videos a month once I hit the $100 goal, and we have reached that. And also thanks very much to the uh, exceptional generosity of Eddie Bulls, who's basically allowing me to do two in the first month. So this one is dedicated to you, Eddie. This is the one talking about how to actually get into the game, how to get into the nuts and bolts, uh, differences in governments, uh, national ideas, idea groups. Now, there are a couple of topics which I want to delve in more deeply, and that will be something for a future, uh, future tutorial. For example, trade. Trade is the one that always comes up, and that's probably going to be the next one that I visit. But right now, let's get started with this. So, when you're starting a game of European Universalis 4, you are... Uh, confronted with this rather large map. And this has all of the different countries in the game that you can play as. Now I should point out, I'm kind of expecting people interested in this to have some understanding of strategy games. I'm not going to be talking about camera controls, I'm not going to be talking about how to move units, that type of thing. Rather, it's going to be more about the actual mechanics involved in this game. The first decision, therefore, that needs to be made is what country to play as. Now there are a couple of different ways of coming to your choice here. Uh, one of them is obviously you, you pick a country you like, so you say, you know what, I'm from Lithuania, I'm going to try as Lithuania. That works, that totally works. Or you could say, I really fancy playing a very trade heavy game. So you would probably have a look at the various nations which are trade heavy, for example Venice, the Hunsa, Aragon, England, Holland, and you'd play one of those. Or if you are trying to get into the game um, from the start, then there are probably three countries, possibly four countries, that you may want to try as. Uh, the one which I'm going to suggest most strongly is France. And the reason for that is you are strong enough that you can make a couple of mistakes and still be able to play on. Now, this is something I should really point out, actually. There is a metric in various strategy games which I call bounce-back ability. That is the ability to bounce back after a defeat, the ability to continue playing after you've lost a war or two. And your Open of Asalis 4 is probably the game with the most bounce back ability and because of that it is one of the games i would recommend the most highly it is great like you can lose a couple of wars and then the the story that emerges is how you overcame this obstacle how you came back and from the edge of defeat and went and defeated your opponent i've done this on a number of occasions i'm not going to say it's the easiest thing to do but it's absolutely possible to do so like i was saying with france you can afford to lose a couple of wars and it won't really affect you in the grand scheme of things you might lose a couple of territories that's no reason to quit please do not quit just for losing a war um make some new allies build up a new army watch what your enemy is doing once they get drawn into war then maybe that's the time you want to jump in and start smacking them around yourself and then you can recover those lost territories and maybe even take a couple of theirs. So that is the reason I'm recommending France. The other ones I would probably recommend, uh, Muscovy is good because it just it is really strong at the moment. Likewise with the Ottomans. And then France and Castile are kind of in a similar situation, but France has more of this bank back ability. Castile can't afford to make quite as many uh, errors because they do have a very strong... A neighbor in Aragon, they're adjacent to Portugal as well, and Morocco can sometimes also cause some problems. While with France, yes, uh, England's going to be all up in your grill for quite a while. Austria is going to be causing you headaches down the road, and possibly even Poland, Lithuania, and maybe even the Ottomans. But generally, as France, you are without a doubt one of the strongest nations in the map. You have the ability to do basically everything in the game. You can expand yourself um, territorially, so you First of all, you need to consolidate your holdings in France itself. Then you can do the colonial game, so you can head over to the Americas and do all of that. You can fight wars, obviously. You can be pretty involved in diplomacy, so it's playing your major opponents off against each other. So how do you weaken Castile? Well, you try and isolate them, and then you get them into a war with England, for example, maybe over the colonies. Or if you're fighting against Austria, how can you maintain Austria's um, 
Oh, what's the code? Haha, <laughs> status quo. Well, you could probably get an alliance with Poland or Lithuania or just smack them around yourself a couple of times. You can get involved in the HRE if you really want to go into that maelstrom. You don't have to, though. You can get into uh, royal marriages, you can do trade, you can do expansion, you can go over into Asia if you really want to do that. There are many, many different things that you can do as France, and that is why I would recommend that you play them the first time, so then you get an idea of all the different mechanics in the game, and then from there you can say, you know what, I really enjoyed the colonial aspect of that game. Maybe I'm going to focus more on colonialism, in which case you could play as Portugal or Castile or England, or you could say, I really like the trade, so then you go and play Venice or... The Hunsa or something like that. So you, you kind of get the idea that France is really the best introduction for what kind of nation you want to play as. Now one other thing I should point out is each nation has a couple of differences. The most obvious is geographical. France is kind of at the edge of Europe so it can only really be attacked from one maybe two angles. Although in the southern front you have this rather nice Pyrenees mountains down here which makes it very difficult to come from the south into France although you may actually have the same problem going into Spain later on. Um, you are adjacent to the HRE but the HRE tends to be pretty focused on internal disputes at least early on and uh, different nations, yeah. So like I was saying, England obviously is an Ireland. So once you have secured Scotland, possibly Ireland as well, then you can focus more on the naval game. So long as you have the strongest navy, then it's very unlikely that someone can invade you. Uh, kind of similar thing for Scandinavia. There are limited numbers of ways of getting to you. If you're Austria, then you're kind of in the heart of things. You need to worry about the HRE, and that's a, a topic for another time. The HRE is a very different ball game in terms of how you want to play this. And again, different nations have different political setups. So Austria, as I was mentioning there. Brandenburg, you're trying to play off Austria and make them lose their HRE, a Holy Roman Empire uh, status. Maybe get it yourself, maybe give it to someone else who's weaker so that you can start uh, maneuvering yourself into position. Russia, you're trying to spread across the uh, Siberian frontier and they have special mechanics around how to do that so they don't play the usual colonial game. They have different mechanics. Uh, Ming has tributaries and basically playing uh, with their neighbors and keeping everyone in line. You can play as the Step Hordes who are all about being aggressive and attacking people. If you're not attacking people, then you are very likely to start having internal problems because of Horde Unity. India has their own stuff, Africa, and the Americas. Like, if you're playing as one of these very small American nations, like Lanap, or who's the one I played as? Micmac, over here. These guys. Um, then you can migrate. You can literally move your country around the, uh, around the uh, New World. So lots of different ways of doing that. Then each country themselves will have their own national ideas. And that's what these things here are. So if you hover over the lightning bulb, this is telling you the traditions. The traditions are the things that you start with. So playing as France, you would have plus 20% national manpower modifier. That means you have a larger pool of troops to call upon in time of war. And diplomatic reputation. That means that people are more likely to make an agreement with you uh, for an alliance or something like that or a vassalization. You then have a set of regular ideas, and these are unlocked as you go through the idea groups. Again, we'll cover that in the game itself. So, for example, we have French language in all courts. Once we get that, that is after the first three three ideas that you've uh, gathered, uh, you get another diplomatic relation. So every country is usually limited to having four relations. That's four vassals or allies or military accesses or trade leagues. For France, you can get a fifth one, so you can have more allies. And again, you're playing on this diplomatic uh, meta game almost you can get one of their most powerful ideas morale of armies plus 20 percent that means your soldiers stay in the fight for longer and you can basically just outlast your opponent and therefore win the battle that way even if you lose more troops although you can absorb the loss of more troops because you get the national manpower modifier so you can kind of see how france is really starting to emerge as a military power um estates general national tax that's you make more money and the list goes on and on and then finally you have the ambition which for france is discipline plus five percent which you get when you unlock the very last of the ideas so basically you get the last idea plus your ambition once you have finished off your national idea group and every nation pretty much every nation in the game at this stage uh has a different set of ideas uh which can really make a big difference so geographically a game between saxony and Brandenburg might not look too different. They're right next to each other, they're roughly the same size, but Brandenburg has really strong military ideas. It's, it's all about their army. Well, Saxony has more about economy, it has more about diplomacy, so it's more how you play the rest of the HRE if against uh, everyone else in order to build power. While for Brandenburg, it's you're basically just smashing in your opponents. Uh, they're not called Space Marines for no reason. They are very, very strong, especially later on. And uh, Brandenburg can eventually get a unique government. So government is another thing which can change the way that the mechanics work. So England, having a 
uh, English monarchy, uh, basically means you start with a parliament. So you need to worry about uh, what seats uh, your government has, and that gives various bonuses around your country, but also means that you have to hold debates, and you have to try and win these debates, and there's an entire mechanic system around there. You have merchant republics, like that of Venice, which basically means you can trade more, but your country is limited in size. Now, at the moment, I wouldn't really recommend playing as a merchant republic. I think they're kind of underpowered. So if you want to try playing as a trade nation, I would instead recommend probably Aragon, or even Oman over here. Slightly more difficult, thanks to your closeness to the Ottomans and the Timurids, but Oman is also a very strong trading power. And there are a couple of others scattered around Holland, being another great example. Um, the Ottomans have their own government. Poland has their own. Muscovy has their own. Um, Ming has their own. So that's another factor that you can take into mind when you're choosing this. And again, this is all what adds to the richness of the game, the replayability, and makes every, every different game feel different and work differently and ah oh, it's just one of the best bits about it honestly right so let's jump in as france we're going to play on normal mode we're not going to set up any of the additional settings i think the only thing i've got turned off is lucky nations but that's not really important that just means that the historical historically powerful nations will almost certainly be the historically powerful nations while if you have lucky nations turned off or randomized then that's less of an issue but it still kind of counts because france is still geographically a whole lot bigger than say uh, Frankfurt. <laughs> Frankfurt being that big, France being this big. Right, so once you have started the game, you've chosen your country and you're going, aha, I want to go and attack everyone. Wait, there are a couple of things that you need to do before you even unpause the game. So you'll notice up here, you have the pause button. I have not unpaused it. I've not done anything up there just yet because there are a couple of opening moves that you need to make. So the first thing I'd recommend doing is setting yourself a long-term goal. What do you want to do as France? And this is important because the game doesn't tend to give you these goals itself. There are missions, they kind of nudge you in a certain direction, though you can completely ignore those, and quite frankly, I very often do. But you do need to do something. So you could say, I'm going to play as Scotland, I'm going to beat up England, I'm going to take over Great Britain, and then I'm going to go colonial. Great, that's your goal. Or you could say, I'm going to play as Poland, and I'm going to destroy the HRE. I'm just going to completely obliterate it, and it won't exist anymore. You can do that, fantastic. Off you go. You could play as France and say, I'm going to limit the power of everyone else in Europe so that there is a rough balance kept until the 1800s where I'm going to go suddenly completely crazy and invade everyone. Like France kind of did. Um, thanks, Napoleon. Cool, do it. Uh, but it is quite important to have these goals and maybe a set of smaller goals. So for Brandenburg, you probably want to say, right, I'm going to conquer the Teutonic Order and gain Prussia. I'm then going to form the nation of Prussia in order to get all of the really, really strong military bonuses. And that, at that point, I'm going to say, right, I'm going to go and form Germany. Great, you have your goals. So different nations will have these different goals, and you can kind of pull from history, or you can say, I'm going to do something completely ahistoric. I'm going to take over Europe as England. Didn't happen historically, but go for it. Why not? And there are ways of doing that, absolutely. So as France, I'm just going to say, we're going to... Try and maintain the status quo. We're going to let no country rise too strong. We're going to uh, take complete control over France itself. So that's our initial goal. We're going to consolidate. And then we're going to go for a really powerful colonial nation. We're going to try and beat up England as much as possible. There's our goal. We're going to beat up England. Sounds like a good goal. Um, so then, how would you go about doing this? Well, you'd probably have a look at England. You'd go to England's diplomacy and see what their diplomatic status is. So each country has a number of enemies and a number of rivals. Rivals are saying, I want to go and kill this person in particular. So right now, England's rivals are France, Aragon, and Castile. We ourselves don't have any rivals just yet. You can see that here. We have the uh, rebel flags. And that's because it's telling us, you need to choose some. So we would have a look at our own enemy list. And the enemy list is basically those who have d determined you are a rival. So right now, Denmark, England, and Burgundy are all our rivals. So we probably want to rival them back again. It is almost impossible, in fact, it is just outright impossible to get an alliance with a rival. You might be able to butter them up a bit and have them declare you're no longer a rival, or just over time, politics and diplomacy may shift, and they may decide that they want to beat someone else up more than you. Or you might just become bigger than them, so you are no longer a valid rival for them because the power balance is too great. Or you might lose a couple of wars, and then they grow bigger, and then you are no longer a valid rival. That, that all factors. But there are a couple of other things that you need to consider with rivals. Most pertinently, you want to have a look at, say, England's enemies here 
And these enemies are more likely to be my ally. So if I were now to go and rival England, and honestly that sounds like a really strong choice. So we're going to go ahead and rival England. Then we're going to have a look at Castile. Castile is also rivals with England. So if we go to alliance actions, oh, what's this? Castile wants an alliance with us. Why is that? They're friendly towards us because they like us. They want to maintain uh, good relations with a strong neighbor. Yeah, okay, that's fine. And actually it's not showing up here yet. But they will also have um, a rival is a... You get a bonus for having the same rivals, basically. So we're going to go to Castile, we're going to go Offer Alliance, and we're going to say Confirm. One of the nice things about U4 is it's always going to tell you what the AI does. You saw there it had the complete green bar and then Yes. If it says Yes, they will accept that alliance. So that's a good thing. We have three diplomats and we probably want all three of them put to work before we do anything else. So who else are our rivals? Denmark. Denmark's a bit far away. Yeah, they could eventually become a power because they have a personal union with Norway and Sweden. This basically means that they control... Norway and Sweden as well. So Denmark is actually a pretty strong state. And as they actually integrate Norway and Sweden, then they could become even stronger. We can meddle with Denmark by supporting Sweden's independence to try and break Sweden away from them. So they are two independent state nations. And we know from history that Denmark and Sweden were very often at each other's throats. That's very true in this as well. They could ally, but they probably won't. Um, our other enemy is Burgundy. Burgundy is the other major French power, except for England, who towards the end of the Hundred Years' War, controls large swathes of France. Uh, so we probably want to rival Burgundy as well. Burgundy, actually, let's have a quick look. Have you rivaled... You have rivaled England. Okay, so we're both going to be at odds with England. Sometimes England and Burgundy might not be rivals. So if I went and rivaled Burgundy and England, then that's likely to bring England and Burgundy closer together. So you need to be kind of aware of those diplomatic issues. Uh, who else is rivaled with Burgundy? Only Denmark and Venice, oddly enough. That's a weird choice. Venice isn't really in their sphere of influence. So we can't really play off of any of Burgundy's rivals. We just know that these maroon splodges are clear... Or these Burgundy splodges, I should really say, are clearly actually part of France. So we need to go and pick on them. So let's go and add Burgundy as a rival. Now, sometimes you don't need to have all three selected. Um, unfortunately, because we are such a big state and we have so many uh, rival options, the game is saying, no, you need to have three. So who else do we want to rival? We definitely don't want to rival Castile because we're trying to get an alliance with them. We probably don't want to rival Austria because Austria is another very powerful nation in this area. And we could probably do with trying to butter them up and get an alliance with them in order to go against Burgundy. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to relations actions, improve relations and send someone off to go and butter Austria up. Even if we don't get the alliance with Austria, the improved relations means they are less likely to get involved with wars that we have started. Um, so that's a pretty good choice. Again, we have three diplomats. There's only one now free because one of them's gone to offer the alliance to Castile. One of them's buttering up Austria, so we have got one left. We cannot immediately declare war, but we probably want to think about who we want to go after. So at the moment in France, we have Burgundy. We have... Provence, which is also down here, Nevers, Brittany, uh, also Provence, Lorraine, and uh, Savoy. These are all ethnically part of French culture, and that can actually be seen in the various diplomatic map mode. If I can remember which one it is, I never can. It's here somewhere, there it is, culture. So everything that is this yellow is French culture. So we will benefit from having them within France. So we could even go after Wallonian Belgium if we wanted to, for example. Um, but at the moment, I know from uh, just having played France before that Provence is a very good target. So we probably want to go to Provence. We want to then... Oh, hang on. We're already allied with Provence. There we are. We start allied with Provence. Well, that's interesting. In that case, there is something else we may be able to do with Provence, but that means that we shouldn't go after Provence. We should go after one of the others. So let's say Nevers. We can take over these two provinces. That sounds like a pretty good option. So we are going to go to Covert Actions and then Build Spy Network. Except we can't because Burgundy owns them. Um, do we have a reason for war against Burgundy? I'm not sure we do. So one of the key tenets of this game are casus bellis or CBs, and this is basically your justification for going to war. If you attack someone without a justification, you suffer some really dramatic penalties, and you want to avoid that if you possibly can. So you need to be very mindful of being legitimate in your actions. So you can 
go to Burgundy, you can start fabricating a spy network, and then once you have got 20 spy network, I think, yeah, you can then fabricate a claim. And once you have a claim, you have a legitimate reason to go to war against Burgundy. So we'll prepare for a war against Burgundy. We might go against for, uh, England because we have a core on some of the English territory. In fact, we probably have cores on their stuff. No, we don't. Um, lost my train of thought there. Cores, right. So we need the, uh, the, the reason for war. So the reason we are fabricating on Burgundy is because right now we have no claim to their territory. England, however, we do. Because of the 100 Years War, we still legitimately own large swathes of this territory they have and you can see that by the cause and claims that we have here if we have uh, our french flag with a gold border that means we have a core there that is a cornerstone piece of our territory that is supposed to be part of france and we have a legitimate claim to taking it back off of england through a reconquest so if we were going to go to diplomacy then declare war we can't do this for the first month of the game to stop shenanigans basically but after the first month we can then declare war in england and take that back and we probably will it's a good idea to go to war with england fairly early on depending on who they ally with and who we get as allies and actually england always starts out allied with portugal so getting castile as our own ally is a fantastic move because that means we can put castile and portugal fighting each other while we go and fight england meaning that we don't need to worry about portugal anymore furthermore thinking on a more grand scale if we then eventually decide to move into aragon or castile territories ourselves then these two will have weakened each other in that war conversely it's the same for us so if austria is watching us with hungry eyes they might go ah france is at war with england england's a big enemy we might need to jump in on this one and see if we can take some of france ourselves this is part of the reason we are improving relations with austria to make that less likely to happen so diplomacy is a very important aspect of how this game works all right, so that's all of the diplomatic stuff talked about. So there are a couple more things that we need to do. Uh, we still need the final rival. Uh, who should we pick? We don't want the Papal States because we are currently Catholic and we actually want positive relations with the Pope. So you only really want to become rivals with the Papal States if you're, say, in Naples and you want to expand into Papal territories. Otherwise, it's actually a really good idea to send them a diplomat to improve relations because if you have positive relations you can click on here down the uh, papacy uh, you get additional papal influence which you can then spend on these idea or these uh, bonuses over here so for example if we had 50 papal influence then we can get a 15 percent bonus to our tax income for the next 20 years that is actually a pretty big bonus so having high papal influence which you get by having good relations with the pope is a very good a very strong move so we don't want to antagonize him uh we could go up against savoy it being clearly a part of france i think that's probably the best option so we're going to go ahead and rival savoy the other option was denmark but honestly i just don't see us clashing over very much because we don't have any shared interests right now so denmark's it would be a wasted slot if we were to do that you get bonuses for fighting and otherwise causing issues with your rivals so if we were to take some territories from england then we would get what's called power projection which is this scale up here which gives us various bonuses so with the current 26 power projection that we have we get more trade we get more morale for our armies and navies prestige fort defense legitimacy this is a sliding scale so as we go above zero up to 100 then those scales would basically would go up by another four times so global trade power bonus would be a 20 percent bonus at 100 percent uh power projection which is huge plus when you're at 25 power projection you get a free leader without upkeep that means you can have more generals and therefore more armies in the field and if you get over 50 power projection then you get more monarch points and this slides nicely into monarch points monarch points are probably the most important currency in the game so you do have regular currency which is money which is up here treasury Okay, fine. Monarch points are probably more important because they determine a very large number of things. Monarch points are your technology. You spend monarch points on upgrading your technology, and these will get cheaper or more expensive depending on how ahead or behind times you are compared to the historical norm. So right now we have no bonus or penalty because we are exactly where we should be technologically. If we don't tech up for too long a time, then they will actually get cheaper and we can spend less monarch points on teching up. That is a legitimate tactic and one I've used a number of times myself. But it's dangerous because if your neighbours 
tech up ahead of you, especially in military, then they can do a lot of damage to you. Technology is extremely important, especially for military. So for example, we're currently in military technology three. Once we have technology number four, we get the bonus to military tactics, 0.25, and also a land morale bonus of 0.5. These, at this stage of the game, are critical. Do not go to war with someone who is tech four while you're on tech three. You are almost guaranteed to lose. Even if you're a much bigger nation, well, actually, if you're a much bigger nation going up against Nevers, you probably win just because you're so big. But if you are, say, fighting Austria and they have the tech and you don't, you will almost certainly lose because you have roughly the same military power, but they have those extra bonuses. And that's also where ideas come in. Ideas are basically the way that you have to customize how your nation plays yourself. So you have the national ideas, which are locked. You can't change those. And these um, are unlocked as you get the regular ideas. And that's what these idea groups are here. So... You have administrative ideas, which cost admin monarch points. You have diplomatic ideas, which cost diplomatic monarch points. And then you have military ideas, which use military monarch points. So say, for example, you fight a lot of aggressive wars. You siege down a lot of things. You want to have a strong army. You'd probably have a look here at offensive ideas. Offensive ideas give your leaders more shock bonus, so you do more shock damage in battle. Recruitment time, so you get your armies built more quickly. You get more land fire, so you do more fire damage, as well as the shock damage they do stack. You get glorious arms, so you get more prestige from battles, and prestige is powerful because it gives you more morale, so it means that your armies fight better in the long term. And then you get the engineer course. This is the siege ability, which is the reason we were thinking about taking this in the first place. You get Grand Army, which is Force Limits, which is different to Manpower. Force Limits is the number of standing troops you can have, while the Manpower is kind of your reserve. So we'll talk about that in a minute. And then Discipline is how skilled your, your troops are. So if you have a high Discipline Army, then you're likely to beat your opponents. And Discipline ties in directly to Military Tactics, which we saw a moment ago from the Technologies. Basically... Every point of discipline is one point of tactics, and that reduces the amount of damage you take and increases the amount of damage you do to your opponent. It's important. And then finally, you have army morale speed recovery, which means that after a fight or after a defeat, you can get back into the fight more quickly with your armies. So uh, offensive ideas is a very strong choice for a more aggressive nation to take. So if we wanted to be more aggressive and go after our neighbors quite a lot as France, we might well want to take these offensive ideas. They cost military points. The more military points we spend, the less military points we have for military technology and a couple of other um, abilities. So that is a balancing act. If you think that you need to stay ahead of military tech, then you may not want to take military ideas or you may want to increase the amount of military points you get. And that is determined in a large part by your ruler. So right now we have King Charles VII de Valois. So de Valois is our dynasty. There could be some other nations around with the same dynasty, in which case we're going to have better relations with them. And we could even get a personal union with them, which means we can control their uh, armies and their, their country in much the same way that Denmark can control Sweden and Norway. They have a personal union. They have the same king. Each king has their own stats. Uh, for this guy, it's a 4 to 4. These stats range from 0 to 6. So Charles VII is actually a pretty darn good leader, especially for administra administration and military. His queen is a 4 4 4, so the queen Marie d'Anjou is actually even better, while the heir, Louis de Valois, is not as good. He's slightly better diplomatically, but he's worse militarily. So while we have Charles VII to de Valois, we probably want to focus more on the admin ideas and technologies and military ideas and technology. And we want to be a little bit more careful about what we do with the diplomatic. The other thing we can do is we can focus our... Well, we can set a national focus, which is basically saying, I want more administration ideas. We will click on that and say... We get plus two to administration, so that went from seven to nine, and we get minus one on the others. So this would go from a base of five down to four, base of seven down to six. The way that this works is you have a base of three in each area. You can see there, base value three. Then you add on your monarch's skill. So Charles the Seventh has four admin skills, so that's three plus four is seven. We then have this as our national focus, which is the final plus two, therefore nine. And this is the amount of monarch points we gain every month. So a technology in admin right now would cost us 598 power. We currently have 84 available. Every month we gain 9 more power. And then in a couple of months, so we won't be able to level up until uh, October 1449. So it's five years away in admin tech. So that kind of gives you an idea at the pace of how these technologies and things advance. 
Right, those are the main ways of gaining these. You can also further customize by getting advisors. Advisors have a skill level ranging from level one to level three. Level three is not available yet because our country is simply not big enough. Once you get, probably once we have mo more of France taken over, then the level three guys will become available. They get increasingly expensive. So we have a level one here. He costs us one ducat a month and a base price of 16 to actually hire him. The hiring cost is linked to their age. So uh, Jean-Baptiste Saint-Germain is age 30, so he's relatively expensive. Then we have Pascal de Bethune, who is 40, and he is also slightly cheaper. They also have different abilities. So, for example, Pascal here gives us production efficiency plus 10%. So that's going to increase the amount of money that our resource production gives to us. Jean-Baptiste, on the other hand, is missionary strength plus 2, so he'd be a lot better at converting things. Right now, our entire country is Catholic. That's why we're all gold here. And um, you can choose the different map modes, either by setting up your map mode panel over here by right-clicking one of them, and then left-clicking on this, and then choosing from this massive list what exactly you want to have there. Or you can use these categories. So, for example, to find the political map mode, you would go to the... Actually, I don't know which one that would be. You would go to the political map modes, of which political is then the top, and the political map mode shows you who owns what territory. If you're fighting a battle, then you probably want to have simple terrain, uh, because that shows you where um, battles will go more in your favor or against you. Battles and warfare is a topic for a whole new tutorial, so already we've got warfare and trade, which I'm going to do another video on, so I'm not going to go too deeply into that. Um, so different map modes, very important. Right, back to the advisors. Then we can have a look here at Jacques Cour, who is a yearly inflation reduction, but he gets two admin points per month rather than the one. He is also twice as expensive. And I think that these actually are a sliding scale, so I'm kind of surprised there are only two a month that will go up, um, depending on your technology cost. No. Actually, I don't know how this is calculated. I know it goes up. I think it's by your tech level. There is a modifier. If we have a look at the military ideas, for example, then we can see here we have some different ones. The different military ideas will be different from the admin, and we get different bonuses. Ah, here we go. These guys cost four a month, while the level ones only cost one. So I don't know why these are so cheap. Probably because they are specialist. Um, we'll talk about that in a minute. So for the military ones, we probably don't want to go for the level 2s because they're very expensive. And if we go over to our economy tab, oh, by the way, you can access all of your country information by clicking on your crest. That brings up all of these different tabs, and that is how you access the information for your nation. So if we go to economy, we can get an overview of precisely how much money we are making over here in income and how much we are losing, expenses. And then a couple of sliders, so we can have a bit of control over precisely how much we're making or losing. So you'll see if we decided to pay our army nothing by reducing maintenance to zero, then we would make almost double the amount of money we're currently making. That's one of the choices you need to make. So if you're going to be at peace for an extended time and none of your neighbours are being particularly hostile, there's no real reason to pay your army. Just drop it down to zero. That just means that you're not paying extra salaries and your armies will not reinforce if they've taken damage. But if you are expecting a war or if you're already at war, you probably want this thing whoops, at maximum, in which case you are paying everyone the maximum amount of money. Um, you get more morale, so you lose half of your morale, if not more, probably more, if you're not paying your armies. But they're at full fighting strength if you're paying them fully. And it's the same for fleet maintenance. Generally, I would not suggest dropping fleet maintenance uh, because your trade ships will also lose power if fleet maintenance is low. And trade ships will always be active even during peacetime, so you almost never want to drop this. Instead, to save money on fleets, you can do what's called mothballing instead, which is this button. And that basically drops their maintenance for this unit, or for this army, or this navy, only. Unfortunately, the same thing does not exist for armies. It can only work with navies. Um, it means that you're paying far, far less for this fleet. So the Munch fleets, which is our heavy ships and our transports, this is like our transport fleet, we wouldn't be paying them. Their combat strength would go down to 25%. It would take them a couple of months to regain full strength again once we unmothball them and we would start paying them again. So it is risky. If you're expecting big naval battles, don't mothball your fleets. If you're expecting a period of peace, mothball them. You, you, there's no reason to pay for your transports and your heavies unless you're actively using them, of course. Right, so depending on the amount of money you have here in your balance, and you can see immediately this has gone up because we have mothballed our um, munch fleet, that will show us how much money we have spare. So we have five ducats, so we could probably hire, say the inflation reduction guy 
for two ducats, so our money now goes down to three. And a military, we'll probably only go for a level one, so we'll take the maintenance modifier. That means we're actually paying our armies less, so it won't be quite as big a, a deficit. And then a diplomat as well. We can in fact get a level two cheaply, which is this guy. Um, I had not noticed that starting diplomats at these different prices. That's... See, even I'm learning stuff. I have more than a thousand hours in this game and I'm still finding new things. I just didn't expect it to be quite so early. So we are now paying five ducats a month in um, advisor costs, but we are gaining an additional two admin points, two diplo points, and one military point. So the best way to see advisors is converting money into monarch points. If you have the money available, I very strongly recommend that you have advisors if you can. If you need the money for building fleets and stuff like that, then sure, you can probably ditch a couple of the advisors. Just be aware that you will lose your diplomatic and ideas edge. So it's a balancing act. A lot of things in this game are about making meaningful choices, which can really affect your nation like this. So we're going to have a lot of monarch points. We should be able to tech up pretty darn quickly. We should be able to get a good amount of ideas. Furthermore, Different mnemonic points also have different, <clears throat> excuse me, different abilities. So, for example, you will have noticed here we have some buttons down at the bottom. If our inflation was running high because we're taking a lot of loans, I'll talk about loans in the trade video, then we probably want to pay some of that off. We have an inflation reduction guy, which means that every year it will go down by 0.1. That's nice, but it's still fairly slow. If we need to drop it more quickly because inflation increases the cost of everything else, then we probably want to spend a couple of admin points to reduce inflation, and that will cost us 75 admin points per two points of inflation. It's not telling us that there, but if we actually had something to reduce, then it would tell us it would cost you 75 admin points to reduce this by two. That can be modified depending on what ideas you have. So, for example, if you have got... I can't remember is economic or admin. I think it's economic. No. Oh, did they remove that one? I think they might have. Yeah, they have. Okay, so there used to be an idea which let you reduce the amount of uh, inflation that you were paying for, but they rolled that in into one of the other ideas. Okay, fair enough. That probably actually happened a while ago. I haven't really paid attention because it was an ability I almost never used because I almost always got the inflation reduction. So there are different ways of achieving the same goals. That's another thing to remember. Okay, so I think that's the budget taken care of. The next thing we want to have a look at is our military and the strength of our military. So right now, we click on the sword and hammer tab here, and that's the production interface. And this gives you a lot of really, really useful information and lets you manage things from the higher, more um, uh, strategic view rather than zooming right in and doing it on the province view. And a lot of the stuff that you can do here, you can also do on the province view. So we can click on Recruit Regiment and we'd have the same interface to recruit things. It's just much easier to do it from here because it gives you more of an overview. So for example, Army Force Limit, 27 of 37. So right now we have got 27 different regiments on the map ready for action. However, our limit is 37. So we can maintain 37 active duty regiments on the map at any time without incurring extra costs. Now we will have to pay for these troops, so if we hired another regiment of infantry then we would have to pay a 0.19 ducats a month for that infantry at maximum maintenance. That number will be lowered if you don't have maximum maintenance, so that is something else to consider. Cavalry, quite a lot more expensive, cost 0.46 per month. That is reduced because we have the land maintenance modifier reduction guy, so having some land maintenance modifiers can make a big difference in how much you're paying for your army. And 90% of the time, your military will be your biggest expenditure. I mean, if we're having a look at our budget right now, we're paying five on advisors, and we've got some pretty expensive advisors. We're spending four on forts, and that can be reduced, but we're spending 6.9 on our army right now, and 0.77 on our navy, again, because some of the more expensive ships are mothballed right now. So armies are very expensive, and that should be considered, but we are France. We have a pretty darn strong economy, another reason to play as France, and we have a lot of army force limits. This is a soft cap. You can go over it. However, the more you go over it, the more you will be spending on each individual regiment. And that counts even more so for mercenaries. We'll talk more about mercenaries in the trade video, I think. Because I am very much of the economic thought where money is a weapon and it should be used as such. So you can raise a lot of mercenaries and you're basically paying money instead of manpower for fighting battles. It's, it's a pretty potent tactic. More advanced. We'll talk about that later. So... 
For France, we're expecting to get into a war against England. England is a pretty strong neighbour. We probably want to invest in more troops. So what troops do we need? Well, I'm going to talk about that in a different video, but I'm going to touch on this now. Um, actually, yeah, I'll talk about it more in the warfare video. But basically, what you need to know is early in the game, like right now, cavalry rule supreme. The reason for that is because they do more shock damage, and shock damage has a bigger multiplayer if you check this, then you can see precisely how much damage each unit is doing in terms of shock. So right now, each cavalry unit does one shock damage, while each um, infantry unit does 0.5. So cavalry do a lot more shock damage than infantry, and the infantry fire amount, 0.35, is still pretty low. So in the beginning of the game, cavalry rule supreme. So we probably want to hire a couple more cavalry, but... Do not go entirely cavalry. If you're Even if you're a really rich nation like Venice, you should not go entirely cavalry. And that is because there is a limit to the amount of cavalry you can have compared to infantry. So right now we have 10 infantry and 4 cavalry. That's totally fine. This number would go red if it was uh, wrong. You can have up to 50% of your total stack size as cavalry. So having 10,000 or 10 as it, 10 regiments of infantry and 4 regiments of cavalry, we could actually have 10 regiments of infantry and 10 regiments of cavalry. But infantry tend to die faster than cavalry, so as soon as this number dropped below the number of cavalry that we have, the cavalry would then start taking a huge penalty because you have too much cavalry on the field and they're not being properly covered by the infantry. <clears throat> different nations have different ratios. So for example, step hordes, you can very feasibly get to 100% ratio, so you can have 100% cavalry and no infantry entirely reasonable. For eastern states like Poland, Lithuania, Muscovy, you can have up to 60%. For Muslim states, I think it's 80%. For westerners, though, it's 50%. So that is something to consider. We cannot go overboard in the amount of cavalry. We do need some infantry to support them. And this is still very early in the game, so artillery are not a thing yet, but artillery will be very powerful and become increasingly powerful later on. So initially, Artillery is there in a bombard capacity. They are there to knock down city walls. They're not going to be very effective on the battlefield. So you probably want roughly five per army maximum. You, you won't need to go over that, really. Um, and by army, I mean one of these stacks. Right now we have a 14,000-man army here and a 13,000-man army here. So we could have, like, five cannons and five cannons. That would be 10,000 total, but five in each stack. Each stack could then siege down one uh, castle, and it would be totally fine. Except for supply limits. Again, warfare. Worry about it then. Ah, uh, what was I up to? Um, <laughs> oh, I hate it when this happens. Right. Choosing what troops to uh, recruit. So early on, you want to have probably closer towards the 50% um, limit for cavalry. As the game goes on and infantry becomes stronger and stronger, you want to drop off the amount of cavalry and possibly replace the cavalry that you're losing with artillery, and then eventually you want to have even more artillery, possibly even almost equal with the infantry to artillery ratio. There are a couple of tricks that you can use behind the scenes to decide exactly what composition you should have, but that is honestly right now beyond the scope of this video. Likewise, choosing what kind of infantry you have. So at the moment, we have a choice between Latin medieval infantry and halberd infantry. Your entire army will take on this template. This is more of your military doctrine rather than an actual unit type. So although it makes no sense to have an army entirely composed of longbows, you would have an army of only longbows or only men-at-arms or only Gallo-like infantry. They have different attributes. They have different roles or or different strengths and weaknesses in battle very very quickly this is determined by the number of dots or pips that they have so latin medieval infantry have a yellow pip in morale that means they do more morale damage they also have a green pip in morale that means they take less morale damage from the opponent so if you find that your armies are often routing far quicker than you would expect then you probably have morale issues and you probably want to have the one who is resistant to morale damage so you would take the latin medieval infantry if you are like france and you have fairly early bonuses to morale so for example the alan here then morale is going to be less of a concern for you so you probably want to be hiring troops that have got more um, bonuses elsewhere and less in morale defense so instead of one point in morale defense we have one extra point in shock that means we are doing more damage to the enemy numbers in the battle than we are uh, blocking the amount of morale damage we are taking and these ratios can change as the game goes on and it becomes more and more complicated but generally you want to have an idea of how your army fights and then 
uh, compose your army doctrine accordingly. So someone like England, who may not have as many land-based bonuses, they probably want to have the more defensive troops. Someone like France, who's usually got excellent armies, you could probably afford to double down on that fact to make your armies even stronger. Another factor to take into this is fire pips and shock pips. So right now, um, let's go down to one where I can really see that. So this this is where it really starts to happen, uh, military tech 12 between tercios and free shooters. If you're a country like France with a lot of manpower, thanks to our manpower bonuses, and also we're fairly large, so we have a large manpower pool, we can probably have less of the defensive pips because that means the amount of manpower we are losing as opposed to the amount of manpower we are inflicting. So if manpower was a concern, we would take Tercio, which has more manpower defenses, while if manpower isn't so much of an issue and morale isn't so much of an issue, then we probably take Free Shooter, where we're incurring more shock damage, so we break the opponent quicker, and we also do more shock damage, so we do more manpower damage to them, while also exposing ourselves to more manpower damage. So we're more aggressive overall. It's a balancing act on precisely how you want to do that. Okay, so I think there are basically two more topics I want to cover in this getting started thing. And that should be, a, honestly, a, a good enough position to get you guys started in your own games. If you want to learn more about precisely what to do after you hit that space bar and unpause the game for the first time, I would recommend checking out some of my other Let's Play games, especially probably the Custom Nation game, where I tended to take things a little more slowly and explain things more. In my later or more recent EU4 games, I kind of assume that my audience is more um, tuned into precisely what the mechanics are and know what I am doing, so I explain less. Though I, I still maintain this stream of consciousness kind of talking through my decisions and my decision making process because I think that's a very important aspect of what I do on YouTube. I'm, I'm playing these games, yes, but I'm also explaining what I'm doing and why I'm doing it because I have a fair amount of experience in them. So it's not exactly a tutorial per se, but it is certainly a, a strategic guide almost in what's happening. <laughs> so the last two things are missions. Missions I did touch on earlier. You can access it through the stability and through the missions and decisions panel or through clicking on the no mission selected. You will have a choice of three or less and these nudge your country in a certain direction. So for example, our manpower and reserves need to recover. This is because we've just spent a bunch of manpower on building up our army. Each regiment that we build costs 1,000 manpower. Every time we suffer casualties in battle, it comes out of the manpower pool and these guys basically flow into our standing armies. So this is saying your manpower reserves are pretty low. We have a maximum of 41,000. That is the absolute limit of how many uh, troops we can have in reserve ready to fight. Uh, that can be increased or decreased by the amount of territory you own and also different ideas. So the... Doo -doo 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 -doo, where was it? We have 20% more national manpower modifier. That means we can store up to 20% more than we should do for a country our size. Okay, so back to the mission. So we could take that as our first mission, but because we're going to go to war and it is uh, cancelled as soon as we go to war, that's probably not a great choice. We could also get a ma royal marriage with Provence. It's not a bad idea. Provence is a vassal right now, so we could uh, integrate them over time diplomatically. That is another form of conquest. You have military conquest, which is literally just occupying stuff and then taking the land in a treaty, or diplomatic, where you get them as a vassal and then in over time you... Uh, vassal, no, no, you don't vassalize them, you integrate them, annex them. I can never find these options when I need them. Yeah, yeah it is, it's definitely here somewhere, or it should be. No, we have an alliance, we don't have a vassal. Sorry, they're an ally, they're not a vassal. So we could vassal them in time. Uh, except Provence will say that they would never accept that. So actually with Provence, we're more likely to break that alliance and invade them ourselves rather than try and build up the alliance. So we may not want that royal marriage because if you have a royal marriage with someone, you suffer stability penalty for declaring war on them. And that's a bad thing. Stability is a scale from minus six to plus three. Uh, generally, you want it to be zero or higher. Otherwise, you start suffering some really negative events and some pretty hefty debuffs to your country uh, as a whole. So going to war with someone you have a royal marriage with is a bad idea. However, you can firm up a, um, an alliance. So for example, once we have the alliance with Castile, we probably want a royal marriage with Castile to boost our relations even further and also suffer that penalty if they decide to declare war on us and break the alliance. Plus, uh, you can get into all kinds of dynastic aspects as well, like the personal unions, inheriting thrones, that type of thing. 
Honestly, that's not my area of speciality, so I'm probably not the best one to ask about precisely how to do that, but Royal Marriages is the first step. And then finally, we have got Reclaim Main, which allows us to uh, invade for Main, which is currently an English province, so we probably want to do that. And this is saying our objective is Main owned by France, and then if we own Main, then we get a 10% manpower recovery speed bonus and a one, uh, plus one prestige a year bonus for the next 10 years because we have the inspiring victory and once we have completed this or cancelled it or failed it then we would get another mission and so on and so forth all right so those are basically all of the opening moves that you would need to do to start a game like this one final thing is decide precisely what your opening goals are so i spoke about what the long-term goals are so for france we were going to try and beat up england try and get a colonial empire and preserve the status quo in europe Okay, that's our long-term goal, but short-term. We probably want to consolidate France. So everything which is French culture within France, we probably want to own, either through conquest by beating them up, a la England, or trying to get a, a vassalization on them, like Provence, or, yeah, those are the two main ways. Um, so we probably want to end up owning all of this. This will eventually take us into conflict with several other nations, Burgundy, England, Brittany, Provence, Nevers, Barois. No, sorry, that's not Barois. Um, Lorraine, and then even the Pope who owns on Avignon down here and Savoy. So several different things happening there. But that probably is a fairly decent goal. And the reason for that is you suffer penalties if you have people of a different culture in your nation. So if we were to invade England and take some English territories, they are of a different culture. They are not um, French. So we would suffer penalties over ruling them. We can convert their culture but that is expensive. We can also accept their culture using the interface in the government thing over here. But again, it's somewhat expensive and you are limited into how many cultures you can actually promote and accept within your borders. Uh, other things we may want to do is acquire strong and strategic provinces. So for example, if we wanted to really secure ourselves against Spain, we might want to take Navarra here because it is one of the main controllers through the Pyrenees and it is also mountain. So if we stick a fort here, then it becomes extremely defensive. Actually, this is something I should point out. Forts, uh, well, this ties into warfare, but the territory that your fort is in, if someone attacks you and you still own the fort and you attack into them, then you get the defensive bonus, not your opponent, you do. So ordinarily, if uh, England was sitting here and I attacked into them, then we would have forest and I would have the minus one dice rolled for attacker penalty for attacking into a forest and possibly even a minus two if I'm crossing the river. So if I came from Bergenac, for example. However, if there is a fort here and the fort has not fallen, it's still owned by us and Spain or England marches into here and we own Labor, then we go and attack into it, then we get the bonus. So if we were sieging Labor down and it was English and it's still English, then the English army came and uh, relieved it from Bordeaux then they would get, sorry, then we would get the penalties, not them. So if we were to take Navarra, for example, and stick a fort in Navarra, then it would be a minus two roll for attackers. So so long as we held the fort here, it would be a much easier place to hold than Labor. And I think it's the same thing here in Roussillon. No, not really. Um, but Roussillon opens up into Narbonne and Toulouse, so it's, it, it opens the country a little more, while we could force them to come through just Roussillon if we put a fort there, and we would have the fort minus one roll penalty as well for anyone that we were attacking where we owned the fort. So you want to consider strategic elements like that. Another good example would be over here, for example, Tyrol. It's another mountainous territory which is kind of important. Uh, Mantua because if you put a fort there, you uh, exert a zone of control in all provinces which touch it. So if we were in Montour, someone coming into Brescia would not be able to pass into Cremona or Milan or anywhere beyond this because Brescia is controlled by the Mantua fort. So that restricts where people can go. So put a fort in the right place. Again, putting the fort here in Roussillon would mean that people cannot flood through here. We could pass, but they cannot. So Roussillon being Aragonese right now, we could attack into Roussillon, but we cannot run down into Girona, Barcelona, Agel, etc. So that's another reason to hold these strategic locations. So that is something you will want to consider. And there are a couple of provinces which are just really, really strong for that type of thing. Um, just land denial and land control for you. You want to consider trade. Now trade, I have said, I will cover in a different um, tutorial and I will. It's because it's a, it's a topic pretty close to my heart. I generally play very strong trading nations. It's the aspect of the game I enjoy the most. It looks complicated. It looks daunting. 
And when you first get into it, there is a lot of different factors to take into account. But honestly, it's not that hard. It's not that overwhelming. You just need to understand how it works. We will talk about that later. But trade is another of these short term goals that you need to consider. So for France, I can tell you that Genoa is an extremely strong trade node. So you probably want to try and take as much control of it as possible, meaning that you may even want to attack into northern Italy to try and wrestle this away from Provence and these territories away from Genoa because Genoa is going to be a major thorn in your side over the Genoese trade node. So that's another aspect to consider. Then also colonial objectives. So if you're playing as someone like Denmark and you want to be colonial, you might want to consider trying to take over a piece of... Actually, Denmark's a bad example. If you're playing as Pomerania and you wanted to go colonial, you might want to take a piece of Scotland so you have a jumping off point or a piece of Portugal if you can get down there so that you can uh, basically use that as a jumping point to get to the new world uh, more easily. Trade range is calculated by the nearest cord province. So as Pomerania, if you were able somehow to get a cord province here on Connacht, then you could use that as a jumping off point to mean that you could expand your um, colonial range even further and therefore get into the colonial range, uh, colonial race earlier. That's something to consider. That this is why Portugal tends to be a very strong colonial nation. Same with Castile. France and England tend to lag back a little bit just because they are that that much further behind geographically. But eventually they can catch up and with more economic resources at their disposal may actually overtake uh, Castile. Although Castile has got colonial bo bonuses, which France doesn't quite have so much of. So, whoops, that, those were the French ones. You can't see them in-game. In so that is another thing to consider. Um, I think that's it really. So in terms of a getting started, you should now be in a position, you've got the diplomatic stuff sorted out, you've got your military being built, you've got your next target, England, in mind, you've got your, oh, merchants, no, we haven't set out on merchants yet, okay, let's do that real quick, <laughs> talking of trade. You will need to allocate your merchants. So right now, our capital is in Paris. The important thing to really consider is you probably want to have a merchant in Paris at the moment, which currently we don't. We only have two merchants, one in Bordeaux, one in Genoa. Uh, are we really collecting from Genoa? Interesting. So like I was saying, Genoa is an important node, and there is a reason for that. But what we probably want to do is move our trade capital down here. And that is clicking on a province. You will want to be on trade uh, trade view. And you want to have a look at any ic any province with one of these icons. You can hover over it. You'll see local trade power plus 10. That's actually pretty good. Um, you will then want to click on trade port. So once we have 200 diplomatic power, we click on this button. This then becomes our center of tr our, our trade port. And any trade that we collect here gets some pretty hefty bonuses. I will explain that in the trade video. But that is something to consider. So right now we are pushing money from Bordeaux into Champagne and then there is no current link between Champagne and Genoa and then we're collecting in Genoa so we may well want to move the uh, trade guy from Bordeaux into Champagne that's collecting trade that was the wrong button so no we're not going to do that I haven't confirmed anything um, this is a bit complicated setup like uh, France is a bit weird because it's split between so many different trade nodes. If you're playing with someone like England, it's fairly similar. There's just two. Or if you're playing with someone like Venice, then there's basically just the one. Uh, except when you try and push trade in, then it gets a bit more complicated. But that's the topic for another time. So right now, you just need to, for France, consider that you will want to make, uh, what was it, Lyonnais into a trading port as soon as you can to make this as efficient as possible. Once you have that, you probably want to move the uh, merchant from Bordeaux into Paris. We can't do that at the moment because Paris being our capital is where trade is currently collected from. So it's a slightly different situation. But um, okay, France was a bad choice for trade right now to explain it. Um, hopefully it's clear enough though. If you have any other questions, then do let me know in the comments below. I will do my best to answer them. I know this episode is going to have run off quite a lot and I'm sorry about that but there was quite a lot to explain here this is basically going over the basics of the entire sorting game so there is a lot to understand there is a lot more nuance and stuff going on under the hood which I will try and explain in the future in future videos especially trade especially warfare I think those are the big ones possibly uh, ideas as well because ideas and the order you select them in make a huge difference in your nation so if you were playing a really really militaristic nation you decided to take diplomatic might not be the best option it might be a masterpiece depending on precisely what you're trying to do or you could be in the most religiously inert area possible and then take religious is that really worthwhile probably not it matters 
and again to get the most out of your military so what's the difference between offensive and defensive ideas which should you take that's something we will need to discuss in an upcoming video if you do have any other general questions though or if this has raised any issues or you disagree with something i've said here then do let me know in the comments i'll be very happy to respond to that i try and respond and stay on top of basically all the comments that come in over time uh, something i pride myself on this channel so do let me know and do hit me up there if you want me to go into any more detail or just explain something to you Again, comments would be the best place to do that, and I will see what I can do for you. Uh, thank you again very much to the Patreon supporters for making this video possible at all. I am so happy to finally be doing these tutorials. You can expect one of these a month from now on. I'll probably do another one in the next two weeks, which will be trade, uh, thanks to Eddie Bulls, and then we'll go one a month from then on. So thank you, Patreons. Thank you, everyone else, for watching this, and I hope that it has been of some use to you. And I'm really looking forward to hearing your stories of European Universalis 4. Thanks for watching and I'll catch you next time. Goodbye.